Okay, so let's uh, welcome our first speaker, uh, Kento Yagi. So Kento is a, a faculty from the University of Virginia, and he's an expert in, um, say, neutron star equation of state, the interior of neutron star. And uh, that's one aspect. Another aspect is uh, his study using these um, 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 stellar, well, very compact object like stellar, uh, like neutron star or black hole to um, study for the test of general, general relativity. So that will be the focus uh, for today. You, you, you have to use the, uh, the little touchpad over there. You have to change the source. I can, I can help you out. <coughs> There we go, you, you got it. HTMI1. Yeah, this is the first one. 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 The one all the way. The first one. Yeah, yeah. Just, just give me a second. It'll work in a second. Maybe. Hey, no. <laughs> 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 hey, uh, thank you. And thank you very much for inviting me today. Um, I would like to explain a bit about um, some model independent test of GR that you can do with gravitational wave observations. Um, and let me begin by um, showing you uh, this, suppose, yes, I mentioned. So this is a um, list of 10 binary black hole merger events that LIGO and Vago found so far with a corresponding waveform. Um, they, they merged and uh, of course, there's also a binary neutron star merger event, uh, which marked the dawn of quantum and strange astronomy. And right now, they are in a uh, third observational run, and I think they are not in operation currently, and they are in upgrading phase or something that Carl knows, uh, but they should come online soon. And so far, if you go to Grace TV website, then you can see all the candidate events that they have uh, found during the third round. If you click one of the events, then uh, you can see the probability of such candidates being like binary black hole or a binary neutron star or neutron star black hole. And for example, this event that happened in April is most likely to be a binary black hole merger event. Well, another event that happened in April is most likely to be a binary neutron star merger event. And the exciting announcement was made, um, well, exciting candidate uh, is here uh, that happened in uh, August, and this is most likely to be the neutron star black hole merger event. Um, so uh, this is uh, exciting possibility. But today I would like to explain uh, what we can do in terms of testing GR using these new sources, and uh, <coughs> let me explain why these gravitational wave sources are important and interesting in terms of testing GR. I'm going to show you on this plot the um, amount of gravitational potential on the horizontal axis and the amount of curvature on the vertical axis for systems that have been used already to probe gravity. And gravitational potential, if it's a binary system, roughly means how fast each of the object inside the binary system is moving. Well, it? hmm? it on the horizontal axis? Um, it's dimensionless. Okay. Yes, it's the velocity okay. over speed of light squared. Well, curvature on the vertical axis is given by certain combination of <coughs> mass and size of the object that you're probing. Um, and in this plane, if you're in top right corner, it means that you're in strong field regime, while if you're in bottom left corner, you are in weak field regime. That's not according to strength. You don't reach the Planck scale, <laughs> which should be really right. strong. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Uh, I wish we can prove Planck scale, but so far we don't have any observations. Um, so we know that solar system experiments have uh, already carried out very precise measurement, which uh, can be used to test GR. Um, I show here some examples, and you can see that these uh, dots lie on this bottom left corner, meaning that they can only probe weak field aspects of gravity. Of course, we now have very exciting uh, source uh, by using um, Event Horizon Telescope, and since they are looking at supermassive black holes, the gravitational potential is almost unity. So uh, you can test some aspects of strong field gravity by using uh, these new sources. We also have binary pulse observations to do test of GR. And what's interesting is that binary <coughs> pulse uh, systems themselves 
uh, for somewhere here, um, which is very similar to solar system experiments. So binary pulsar systems themselves don't have large potential, no large curvature, but they consist of neutron stars, which are very compact objects. So you can use some of the observables from binary pulsars to prove what's going on in strong field regime. Now let me draw in this plane to um, gravitational resources like the first event in red and second event in blue. And notice first that these gravitational resources lie on this top right corner, meaning that they are truly strong field sources, but moreover they are represented by lines instead of points. Um, this means that within the observation period of like 0.1 to 1 second, these systems spread through all of this range, meaning that they are not only strong field sources, but also highly dynamical. So they are unique and they are very different compared to other systems. So that's why it's interesting to use these new systems to probe gravity. And in particular, I'm interested in probing uh, some fundamental aspects of GR. For example, GR is, is established under four-dimensional space-time. So you can look for the presence of tiny extra dimension <coughs> hidden in the waveform, maybe. Or you can look for a violation of the equivalence principle. Like if you have two black holes and if they're scalar fields, then it might be the case that uh, scalar charges are activated onto these black holes, which will induce scalar force. And this will violate the equivalence principle because scalar charges can depend on internal structure of the objects. You can also check for some invariance in GR, like Lorentz invariance, taking that there shouldn't be any hard free far direction in your space time. There's also parity invariance that you can check. Um, you can also check the mass of the graviton, whether it's massless and whether gravitational waves are propagating at the speed of light or not. And uh, last but not least, GR only predicts um, two tensor degrees of freedom. And we usually decompose that as plus mode and cross mode, but there could be additional polarization modes like scalar polarization, vector polarizations, which will be smoking down for non-GR effect. Um, so, uh, in this talk, I would like to just explain two model independent tests that LIGO back collaboration has already uh, carried out. And one test is called parameterized test, the other one is called Inspire Major Ringdown Consistency Test. Um, what's good about doing this kind of model independent analysis is that um, instead of choosing one specific theory and try to prove one uh, theory one by one, you can first try to uh, work in a generic frame, model independent frame, and then if we'd like, we can map this generic information onto some specific theory if you'd like. Um, the first model independent test is called parameterized test, and there are several good formalisms. Here I pick one formalism uh, proposed by Nico, Younes, and Franz Pretorius 10 years ago. Um, Let's see, the idea is quite simple. In this picture, I show a schematic picture of a waveform, uh, inspired part of the waveform. The one in GR is written in red, while the one in uh, some modified theory of gravity is given in blue. And typically, what you notice is that there is a difference in the phase that we want to be able to capture in a generic way. So what we do is we take a GR predicted waveform phase and add one single correction term that capture a non-GR effect. And V here is the relative velocity of two objects inside a binary system. This correction term has two parameters, beta and n. Beta is called PPE parameter, stands for parameterized post Einsteinian. Um, and PP parameter tells you the overall magnitude of the non-GR effect, while exponent n tells you at which post-Newtonian order the correction enters. Post-Newtonian approximation is done assuming the relative velocity is much smaller than the speed of light, and here we are only keeping the leading post-Newtonian non-GR correction. For example, if you pick one specific theory and you find that this correction uh, can be mapped to that theory with n being zero, that means such a correction enters at the same order as the GR leading effect in terms of post sense. Yes. Can um, matter itself, like if neutron star, mimic mm -hmm. this effect too? Um, yes. So if you have tidal deformability, then that enters first at 5 pn order. So it will have this form with n being 5. Um, and what's good again about this formalism is that this is an ugly summary uh, table showing the mapping between uh, generic PP from the beta and exponent n to each theoretical, um, each theory, example theory. For example, 
Einstein, the atom gas component in the second row is something that I'm coming back later. Um, but we know how this PP front of beta should look like in terms of some coupling constant in this theory. The details are not important, but the point I want to make is there are some known dictionary that we can use. So once we have some information available from gravitational wave observations on these two parameters, beta and n, then we can always map that information to actual theory of one. Um, Okay, so I'll skip all the details and just show you the result. This plot shows the upper bound on PP parameter beta as a function of at which post newtonian <laughs> order the correction enters obtained from two different observations. Um, in this plot, if you are uh, if the number is smaller, that means you're placing a stronger bounds because if you set beta to zero, then you reduce to GR. Um, the first observation is in black dashed line, which comes from double binary pulsar system. And the second observation is the very first event that LIGO bug collaboration found. And green crosses are the ones obtained by the LIGO bug collaboration using actual data using full base analysis. Well, we carried out a simpler version and we use fish analysis uh, that are shown in red dots. And you can see nice agreement between green crosses and red dots but we wanted to extend the bound all the way down to negative post-Newtonian side. <coughs> the message here is that if you want to constrain non jerry effect entering at positive post-Newtonian orders, then you have more advantage by using gravitational wave observations compared to binary pulsars, because these corrections entering at positive post-Newtonian order means that these effects become larger as the binary separation becomes smaller and smaller, and as the velocity becomes larger and larger. On the other hand, if you want to prove what's happening on the negative post-Newtonian side, then you have more advantage on looking at binary pulsars where they are moving relatively slower compared to um, binaries that are about to call less. But uh, one thing we have to be careful is that you cannot just directly compare these two different observations, and that's because there are some theories where if you're looking at neutron stars, you don't see any modifications, and you do need to have black hole to see no zero effect. And for those kind of theories, you cannot apply this black dashed curve. Um, you do need to have some system that contains at least one black hole. So it's important to obtain uh, independent bounds coming from neutron observations and black hole observations. Does that mean the neutron star black hole is a uh, Yes, yes. Um, pro maybe it depends on theory, but in, in general, yes, it's, uh, it has, uh, it's, it's advantageous to look at neutron star black hole system because it has some asymmetry mm -hmm. in the system. Doesn't that mean that you so wouldn't the symmetry be easier mm -hmm. to verify? Or like a symmetric system be easier to know what you should expect? Because if, if you have a binary neutron star mm -hmm. system, then you can assume that whatever happen mm -hmm. is happening inside neutron stars will affect what you are doing. But so any any deviations you will see will be a function of the object in the neutron star. Whereas in like if if the so for a for an system, like, <coughs> system, like if you saw any deviation, mm -hmm. it would like I can imagine it being harder to say whether that deviation is caused by relativity being bad or you you having a neutron star with some matter that behaves mm -hmm. in some way. Yeah, you mean jersey between the effect and other. Things. Yeah. Um, um, but I I think yes, as yes. as you said that it mm -hmm. also depends on what. Tests you are actually testing. Yes, yes, but you're right that if you want to use neutron observations to approach <coughs> GR effect, then uh, you need to worry about the differences between uncertainties in gravity and uncertainties in nuclear physics, for example. Mass gap. Mass gap. Or just to yeah. find a black hole. Black hole is mm -hmm. simple. Yes, you know black hole is simple. Yes. Yeah. Unless they're surrounded by gas, but. <laughs> 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 um, um, and if we use the second event, then uh, you get uh, even stronger constraints, as shown by this blue curve. Now, so we now have uh, these bounds on each p n order. So, what physics can we extract? So, by looking at different post-Newtonian orders, you can extract different physics. For example, if we look at minus one p n order, then you can look for the activation of scalar charges onto black holes, and uh, if such charges are present 
then there will be scalar dipole radiation on top of usual gravitational quadrupolar radiation, and this will make the merger to happen earlier, and this will change the waveform that enters at minus one pn order equation. So by looking at this order, we can check for the violation of equivalence principle. And similarly, you can check, look at different orders, and you can check whether space-time dimension is 4D or not, or whether uh, big G, the gravitational constant, is actually constant or time varying. You can also look for presence of uh, some extra, sorry, some preferred direction in your space time or parity uh, invariance. Um, and this is the current status. Now, um, the next question we can ask is how does this test improve in future um, as detector sensitivity improves or as we have detectors up in space and we have advanced LIGO, currently it's in O3 RAM, it will soon reach into design sensitivity shown by this orange curve. Um, there is a third generation proposal called Cosmic Explorer whose arm length is 10 times longer than advanced LIGO. Um, the most famous plan for the space space detector is LISA. <coughs> which has a best frequency band somewhere like millihertz to 0.01 hertz. There's another um, plan led by Chinese community called Tenqin. There's another plan that bridges gap between brown based detectors and LISA. This is led by Japanese community called Decido and the downgraded version called VDecido. So there are many different proposals and um, let's see how um, this parameter test will improve as uh, we have future detectors. This is the same plot, the current bound in red. If we have Cosmic Explorer, and if we, if this detector sees the same signal coming from GW51914, then the bound will improve into this green one. If we have LISA, then it will improve further into blue curve. If we have Decido that bridges the gap between ground-based detectors and LISA, then we will have even more improvement. So um, the future is bright in this kind of test that we may be able to see order magnitude improvement in this kind of analysis, at least in terms of beta. Um, now let me switch a gear a bit and explain the second method, which is called Inspiral Partial Ring and Consistency Test. What is this? Um, well, so as you may know, the waveform consists of three main parts, in spiral, merger, and ring down. The idea of this test is to treat in spiral part and merger ring down part separately, and from each of these two pieces, we try to measure initial masses and spins of these black holes. Then we make an assumption that GR is correct. We use the result from numerical relative simulation to relate initial masses and spins to final mass and spin of the remnant. Then we can check for the consistency of these final mass and spin quantities from the inspiral part and from the ring down, uh, larger ring down part. Let me give an example. Here I'm going to show you um, the error ellipse contours in final mass and final spin plane with the GR uh, predicted value um, at this point here. <coughs> if we use all of inspiral major ring down information, then this green curve is what you find as an error ellipse in this plane. On the other hand, if we just use inspiral part only, then the error ellipse will expand to this brown one. Um, because uh, we are only using part of the signal, so that's why error becomes larger. Um, we can also use major ring down part of the waveform and do the same analysis, and this blue one is what you find. Now, you can check the consistency between this brown one and this blue one. And if there is an overlap, that means your assumption that GR is correct is consistent. Here, I'm just showing you an example using a simple analysis called Fisher analysis. This test has been carried out by the LIGO Bank Corporation, and this uh, plot on the left um, is what they actually uh, reported using Bayesian analysis using actual data. Um, in spiral, error ellipse is shown by dark magenta uh, control, while post-inspiral or merger ring down portion is shown by light magenta. And you can see that there's an overlap between two controls, meaning that the assumption that GR is correct is consistent. Since there are a few controls involved, they went one step further and tried to combine uh, these different controls to 
compute probability distribution of the difference in final mass and difference in final spin, where by the difference, I mean the difference between mean spiral um, measurement and major being down measurement. If GR is correct, then there shouldn't be any difference between these two, so it should um, have um, the, the GR predict value is at the origin here. This counter is what uh, they measured using the actual data, and since this 90% credible control contains this origin, it means that the data is consistent with the assumption that GR is correct. Um, just like the uh, parameterized of test case, let's see how this test will improve in future. Um, this is the same counter plot with the current uh, event. Now, if we have Cosmic Explorer in future, then this error ellipse will shrink into this red region. We can zoom in. Um, and the point is we will have order magnitude improvement again in this kind of analysis. What's even more interesting is that um, right after the GW5914 measurement, the very first event, Alberto Cesana pointed out that if LISA was in operation several years before LIGO detection, then LISA would have seen a signal coming from the same event. Um, this black spectrum is a GW5914 spectrum, and for example, four years before coalescence is shown by this cyan dot here. So this is. Yes. Can you go to the previous slide? Yes. Uh, when you have this error, that one is uh, in spiral minus merger, right? Yes. So when it goes to the positive, means that in spiral is bigger than merger. Uh, yes. But in reality, mm -hmm. if GR is going to change, I would, I would imagine that it should change when they get closer and closer to each other. Because then, mm -hmm. because then you you better mm -hmm. get to the strong field regime, mm -hmm. and then deviation mm -hmm. would be if there is any deviation, uh -huh. Uh -huh. it would be more transparent. Uh, uh, that so that depends on which theory you pick. And for example, if right. we pick a theory whose correction enters at negative percent of order, that means you will have better chance of finding such an effect if you have a binary with uh, separation being larger, like binary pulse observations. Right. Right, but I'm just saying that mm -hmm. even taking into account these mm -hmm. very inaccurate, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. kind of contours, I see you can roll out some possibilities because I see it actually is not symmetric mm -hmm. to zero, basically, mm -hmm. right? Uh, well, this, but this asymmetry comes from like noise. Um, it, it can come from. Um, but then it definitely mm -hmm. roll out anybody that could be there because mm -hmm. even with noise, you are not mm -hmm. able to see them. You see what I mean? Um, so what we want, uh, if we want to say that non-GR effect is there, then what we want to see is this counter to be shifted such that it doesn't contain the origin GR. Then uh, we can say that something must be inconsistent. Okay. Yeah, let's continue. Yes, later. yes, uh, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I'll show you some examples later. Yes. Can we try to constrain these negative post-Newtonian orders by <coughs> other systems which are even more Newtonian, like the solar system or something? Um, uh, let's see. Um, in some cases, yes. Um, um, but uh, it, it depends on theory. And in some theories, although there are so those uh, negative post-Newtonian cor corrections are uh, typically activated by scalar charges. Um, if you have scalar charges, then there will be scalar dipole radiation. And usually, we have quadrupolar radiation as GR gravitational waves. And this dipolar radiation enters at lower order in multiple, multiple expansion. That's why it enters at negative post order. And so isn't the fact that we're not seeing this in the solar system telling us that well, it doesn't so, uh, so uh, to have large scalar charges, we need to have uh, compact objects. So that's why for these kind of theories, so by using solar system experiments, it's not so useful. The binary pulsar observations are more useful. Yes. So to follow on from that question, does it make a difference that the, so for the really negative cosmic orders, they would, like for the, for the systems that we can observe, uh, the really low cosmic orders would affect their effects would be seen on such incredibly long time scales that we don't like we don't really have any dynamical tests for those sort of things. Um, Does that make a difference? Uh, can you repeat? Sorry. So so like the 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 so for the bunny bunny uh, pulsar for example, mm -hmm. 
well, it's not really a great example because it does change a bit over time. But the like as in in one of the earlier slides, the fact mm -hmm. that you had the weak gravity mm -hmm. cases mm -hmm. shown just as points mm -hmm. then mm -hmm. means that they're not mm -hmm. really mm -hmm. dynamical. That's right. Yes. So would would the fact that they're not dynamical mm -hmm. play or like play a role in the fact that you can't constrain them very much? Or is it just because of dependent on which theory you're trying to choose? Uh, could be. Uh, uh, I need to think about that point, yeah. but uh, I, I can say one thing. So if you want to test time variation G, then this effect enters at minus 4 p n order, and to constrain this effect, solar system experiments can be useful. <coughs> because it doesn't have anything to do with having scalar charges and having compact motion, blah, blah, blah. So it depends on which theory or which yeah, test you want to do. In order to increase sensitivity mm -hmm. to those negative post intuitive mm -hmm. orders, mm -hmm. Would it help if the black holes were larger so that their their effect on the curvature of space time is smaller? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, probably you are right, but um, 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 uh, uh, I need to think about that. Yeah, probably you are right. Um, <coughs> maybe I'm running out of time, so let me continue. Ah, and so this. Let's see. Where, yes, so um, there's uh, this interesting possibility that uh, we can do what's called multi band gravitational wave astronomy, where we can combine ground based observation with space based observation for the same signal, same event. And then, um, if we have such kind of um, multi band event, then the error ellipse will shrink even further. Um, now, one thing it has not been done yet is to go one step further and try to apply this generic test in Spamajor in the consistency test to actual theory because unlike our direct case, we don't have a mapping dictionary available so that we can map this generic information to actual theory. So we pick one example theory that's motivated by string theory called einstein dalton gans pone gravity, where in the action you have einstein hilbert action plus a correction term that involves some scalar field being coupled to curvature squared with a coupling constant alpha. There's also a kinetic term for the scalar field that I'm not showing. Um, <coughs> and let's see how we can apply this IMR, inspire major income consistency test to prove this specific theory. Um, again, if GR is correct, then we will have error ellipse centered around GR value. But let's imagine that in reality, it's this um, string inspired theory that's correct. So we are going to inject a signal uh, computed in this theory, but we use template uh, computed in GR. So we are making an assumption that GR is correct, but in reality, we are assuming that GR is not correct. Then what we see is that, for example, if we inject a signal with this coupling constant alpha to have some value different from zero, say 0.2 kilometers, then this error ellipse is, will shift downwards, and this contour in red is now only marginally consistent with the GR assumption. If we further increase the coupling constant to 0.3 kilometers, then we have um, completely a uh, complete deviation away from the GR prediction. And now we can start to say that this blue contour is inconsistent with the assumption that GR is correct. So there must be something going on. Uh, it could be non-GR effect that's hidden in the waveform. Uh, and from this example, uh, if in future we do not see any effect, that means we can place bound on this coupling constant alpha to be 0.2 kilometers. The current bound is uh, coming from <coughs> low mass X-ray binaries or gravitational wave observation to be two kilometers. So if in future we don't see any effect, then we can improve the bound to be 10 times greater. On the other hand, if the true alpha lies in between 0.2 to two kilometers, then future multi-band astronomy will have chance to measure such um, evidence. With um, the parameterized test, the first part mm -hmm. of the talk, mm -hmm. better or this mm -hmm. kind of test better for us to distinguish mm -hmm. different um, you can You can put uh, comparable bounds using parameterized test. What laboratory Lab, uh, for, for this specific test, uh, laboratory experiments is not so useful, and that's because the correction enters at um, a strong field uh, regime. 
or you need to have scalar charge to being activated to produce scalar type of radiation, so you need to have a black hole. And for this system, if you have neutron stars, then scalar charges are suppressed. So you have the most advantage to have at least one black hole. Okay, uh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll let you go on. I'll ask you <laughs> yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, no? uh, so what is alpha? I, I missed this. Alpha is a coupling constant <laughs> between scalar field and metric. And that's to what curvature you need in order to see an effect. And uh -huh. you notice that kilometer is much bigger than the Planck scale by some <laughs> 24 of this <laughs> magnitude. So, you know, from fundamental physics, we'd expect nothing. Right. So if you want to see this effect, then there, yeah. there, there, we hope to have some enhancement mechanism that we don't know. <laughs> But we, we need to keep testing. Um, okay, so um, let me just conclude. I explained two different model independent methods to do <coughs> tests of GR using gravitational waves. And uh, in both cases, we will have significant improvement as uh, future detector sensitivity improves. And in particular, we applied the second method to some specific theory for the first time. And we found that for string inspired gravity, we will have one order magnitude improvement. And I'll stop here, and I'll be happy to take any questions. I'm just curious to understand this last consistency <coughs> test further. If you assume, for example, the modified theory of gravity, instead of GR when you do the consistency test mm -hmm. with the data, mm -hmm. are there, uh, can you rule out further models? Are you really uh, doing the same thing? So if, if you don't assume GR but do mm -hmm. the consistency test, mm -hmm. is it consistent with the LIGO data? Well, it would depend on the model you assume, but can you rule out? Uh, so you, you, you use a non-GR template to do this test. Yeah. Um, that's an interesting possibility mm -hmm. that I've never thought about. Um, um, if you do that, then uh, let's see. So if, uh, if in reality uh, it's the, this string is by theory that's correct, and if it's square root of alpha is 0.3, then if you use this uh, non-GR template to do this kind of test, and um, this control will uh, go back to uh, something like this blue one, where it will center around this origin, because you're using the correct template. Yes, but uh, the real data we didn't inject, so maybe I can uh, um, ask if it's consistent, assuming that different test of GR. Right, let's yeah. see. So you, uh, in, in reality, uh, uh, data is data, so we use the whatever data the model yeah, yeah. detected. Then we can try, for example, GR template first, and if you see some uh, inconsistency, then you sure. can try to use a new template that is computed with non-GR one and see which one is consistent, for example. That's a possible case. Is it easy to generate those non-GR templates, no, or? It's not. Uh, well, so if you want to have complete <laughs> template, then it's very difficult because you need to do new recorded simulations in each of these non-GR theories. Here, I just took a leading correction in the spiral, and for the ring down uh, part, people have computed uh, ring down frequency and damping time for this theory. Um, so I basically took some uh, corrections that have been already known to construct um, template in this theory, but that template is not perfect. Is there a black hole? Is it known that there is a black hole in such a theory? Mm -hmm. Yes. It's, it looks just like the black holes that we are familiar with? Um, but it's different from Schwarzschild. It, it, it will have correction to the Schwarzschild metric that uh, depends on this alpha. Our second speaker today is going to be Paul Tita. Paul is a uh, graduate student at the University of Waterloo uh, and also a, a resident student at the Prisoner Institute working with Avery Broderick. Paul is a member of the Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration. He's been a critical component of the modeling and uh, parameter estimation efforts. Uh, continues to, to really make strides in that area. Um, and he's also, I believe, one of only two 
real Canadians in the entire <laughs> Med Horizon Telescope collaboration. What, is, what does that mean? <laughs> and people who are Canadian citizens. This is what that means. Not just Americans living in Canada. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like a bunch of Americans living in Canada. But he's one of the only actual uh, Canadians. Right? And today he's going to tell us about space time tomography with the EHT. Thanks for that, Tom. Yes, Doris. one of the only Canadians. <laughs> this is an it's insight. A it's a conflict. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> this this might be because our Prime Minister thanked uh, Avery for being the uh, Canadian in the, in the collaboration. I was, yeah. But, so I'm going to talk about space-time tomography with the Event Horizon Telescope. This is work I have done with primarily a, a postdoc at uh, Perimeter Institute, Hung Yi Poo, and all of my supervisor, Avery. So, First, a little uh, review of the Event Horizon Telescope. It is, in truly all sense, a global collaboration. We have 300, around 350 members from around the world, and we actually have representation, at least in terms of uh, continents and where telescopes are, on every continent except Australia. So we have, a, we have a telescope on the South Pole, we have a telescope in Africa, Asia, North America, and uh, South America with ALMA. And we have two primary targets, the one I think everyone's familiar with. M87 was on the front page of almost every newspaper, but there is another a source that nobody talks about, well, except before this one came out. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Sagittarius A star. And Sagittarius A star is different for a few reasons. One, it's uh, much, much closer, so it's the center of our galaxy. And two, and this is important, is its mass is very well known from either orbital motions or the gravity, the gravity collaboration. And because of this, we can actually tell you what the m over d, or the angular size in the sky of the black hole is roughly. It's probably around 50 micro arc seconds, unless something really strange is going on. And then it's also, because of this mass scale, is much more variable and will flare around one to two, every one to three days. And this is an example of a light curve. That you see, so this is a, you see these flares happen broadband, so this is in the X-ray, infrared, and then submillimeter. And then, I think it was about two months ago, there was this uh, UCLA had an announcement where they actually were observing Sagittarius A star inside Brighton 75 times in a period just of a single observation night, which is much different than, than M87, which will typically change over the time scale of hours and like around. It will remain constant for one observation. So the reason that we are interested in looking at uh, Sagittarius A star specifically is because of these flares. And one theory put forward actually originally by uh, Avery and uh, Avi Loeb was uh, hotspots in, uh, in an accretion disk from something akin to a, a solar flare where you have a magnetic reconnection event, a very violent event. It dumps a ton of energy into the accretion disk and you'll end up with these very non-thermal parts of particles orbiting around some black hole. And one of the predictions of this theory was uh, that the center of light will wobble or orbit around where the known position is. And this was recently seen by the gravity collaboration, providing evidence that at least some of these flares that we see in Sagittarius A star are from orbital motion or orbiting features. So, what we want to do, or at least what the point of my project was, or and still is, is to see if the EHT can constrain this. As in, we have this, we have this orbiting feature. Does the EHT, at least in its current configuration, have the resolving power to pick one of these out and it learn something about the physics that's going on, the spin, the accretion flow? So, how confident are are we that the flares are coming from? orbiting hotspots on the disk rather than from the outflow or uh... uh... so it could be from an outflow is in like a, a wind the, I don't think a, a wind would give you this is how much you believe the gravity results if you really believe it's a closed orbit like gravity saw then I think that's pretty good evidence that it's some orbiting feature if you think that maybe it's some feature getting launched out of the disk or lo and behold there's a jet in Sagittarius A star which, mm, they know. saw the period as they saw the periodicity. Yeah. the right period for that. Yeah, they, they, saw the, they saw the periodicity here. They saw it in two separate flares. They, and, and the circle. And the circle here. So they saw the motion go something like this. So it was a, it was a pretty neat result of something happening. And then I, I believe 
the uh, radius they got from it was around um, 10 m or 6 m. 6, 6 to 10 m. 6 to 10 m. Yeah. So it was it was right next to the ISCO, or where it's just where you would expect it to be. So. Again, what we want to do is we know that these exist in infrared. That's where those flares were seen. We want to see if we can catch one of these flares with the EHT and then pick it off, and the ability of the EHT to do that. So the first thing we did was actually we made some changes to the model. One of the, the original model it assumes that the hotspot itself it in, it's injected and then it remains coherent. But typically, and you can see any GRMHD simulations. Here's one. The flow is differential. If you just see, you can even just understand it as a Keplerian motion. The thing will expect to shear out as it falls in. So what we did was we wanted to figure out an efficient way to introduce the shearing because if I'm trying to do parameter estimation, this has to be fast. And to do that, we just assumed some prescribed velocity field. So we assume that it has some form like this and that it's azimuthally symmetric and time symmetric, so angular momentum and energy are conserved. And then we assumed a very specific form for the radial and the angular part, where the FS subscript is a free fall motion, so you just let a particle go. You just drop a particle and it falls in, and then the Keplerian is the standard Keplerian motion in the disk. Then it's a, it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. You just solve the continuity equation with this, you, and you find that you have an analytic form of your density, it will just update like that. And that makes it very <coughs> fast to compute. And just to get an idea for what this uh, accretion flow looks like is this, is this is three different models with this alpha, which controls how fast things inflow. And you can just see, as it gets sheared out, these density profiles, well, they, yeah, they just get sheared onto these long arcs. The, the next step was, we have to actually make an image, something similar to this. So we, we use the standard method in the field, a ray tracing algorithm, where we assume that the spot is some self-absorbed non-thermal synchrotron, which is, um, which, is a, which is correct at uh, 230 gigahertz. Cooling time, which is XXX, X, X, there is much too long for us to worry about cooling. Cooling is more important in gravity, where they have these infrared flares. Um, and so the end result is our model parameters are the mass of the black hole, the spin, the inclination, the initial location of the spot, so where I put it around space-time, some initial radius, azimuthal angle, and if you want it to be off-plane, you could potentially make it off-plane. And then our accretion flow parameters, and then just image rotation. Are you assuming that something points it together or not? Um, is there a magnetic structure there? So, the, so the, there could be... Typically in these, these RIAF models, the beta is 10. So the gas pressure itself should just prevent it from blowing up into some like bomb. But if you look at the solar... The, sol but the solar corona is a very low beta, right? Because it's right at the surface, so you'll get those huge arcs that come out. But at least, at least what I understand is that the, in these accretion disks, beta, your plasma beta is 10, so your gas pressure should be strong enough to contain it, at least hopefully for a long enough time so that it can shear out. But there could be some crazy magnetic topology in there that does some stuff. So how, how long is the orbital period for this hotspot? So, so typically we assume these around the ISCO, which for a spin zero black hole is about 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. So we'll, it will, you'll, you'll see it orbit a few times, hopefully, before it dies away. How has spin of black hole may possibly change it, you know? So the, the spin will, will change a, a few things in terms of the time scale. The, the beating, how fast this thing goes around, and then also for this one specifically, or, or both of these, the uh, the time delay from this, which is the primary emission of the spot, and then this is actually the secondary emission, and uh, the the total time it takes for a geodesic or a light to scoop around the black hole and come into our eyesight will change depending on the spin. And I think there's a there's a paper in preparation by Mariamo that shows. Um, that this is actually helps break this degeneracy between spin and um, like uh, orbital motion. So this hotspot is in the uh, equatorial location, plane. The equatorial plane. So in the galactic plane or, or something no. like that. No, not in the galactic it's plane. In, it's in the equatorial plane of the uh, black hole. Of the black it's hole. in the accretion disk. Right. So so this it looks like it's going around like like this though, right? Because yeah. of the the bending of light. Yeah, yeah. It's the it's the old uh, you know interstellar. You see the backside of the right. disk. Right. So so uh, I have a question which you may not be able to answer for the last anyway. What would gravity 
the gravity instruments say about this? Would they say it is in the equatorial plane, or would they say? Gravity said it was in the equatorial plane. They, they would say this, right? This, no, 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 no. This, this gravity would say looks, this, if you draw a light curve of it, looks quite a, or if you draw a centroid, looks different than what gravity saw. Didn't gravity see face on? In her, uh, gravity claims to have seen face yeah, on. So, so that, that, that's, that, that's different than in the equatorial plane. Right? Uh, so, so the disk itself is face on. So here I'm assuming that the disk is about 60 degrees. Right. So if the disk was face on, you would see something much I have. Uh, it's here. This is hidden. So this is what happens when you uh, change the inclination angle and the spin. Right. So. So what gravity claims is something more close to this, is what they saw. Is I, they, I guess what I'm asking is, could you deceive yourself just by the dimming of the, of the light? That, that oh, so, so we don't, I don't, um, okay, so there is some minor dimming when EHT does this stuff in terms of scans, or scans are like 10 seconds. Could, could, could they have deceived themselves? Could, could gravity have deceived themselves? Yes. I, well, like, there, there could be things with this in terms of, like, if you ask me the most, the part that I'm the most, like, the least comfortable with in terms of the gravity results is the inclination. Because it's different than what EHT claimed to see in the past. Okay. And we did these experiments in the past fitting accretion models, we get an inclination around 60 degrees. Could the inclination be changing? What the fast, what's the fast time scale you can imagine the inclination changing? Uh, a wobble that big would be impressive. I, 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 uh, I don't know, you'd have to come up with some explanation for a torquing that quick, and I, I don't know off the top of my head if there is anything that can do that wobble. That's, that's, a, that's, a, that's like a 60 degree or a 50 degree wobble in the disc. It could also be that the spot's not in the disc. Say if the, the where the spot's going and the disc, they're misaligned or something along those lines, or also um, it could be shearing. Like that spot model they fit didn't have any shearing in it, and the and if the model does shear out, you'll actually see differences in the uh, light curve. And What's shear? What's so shearing, shearing I, I mean um, differential rotation. Differential disc. rotation in the disc. So the disc rotates oh. at different rates. And go back to where I was. Velocity shear. Yeah. So the the velocity field we have itself um, has some shear component in it. So you'll. So if you assume, if, if you just track where each of like ribbon of this gas goes, you'll see. So these ribbons you see coming up and beating off are actually just different parts of the disc lighting up, and that's why it's moving out. So that's the shear, just from uh, time delay effects. But this is just the spot has some initial Gaussian part. It looks exactly like this, and then as it goes, because the velocity field has some differential rotation, it shears out. So. How we went ahead to extract this with the EHT is we used uh, EHTIM, which developed by uh, a bunch of people here at BHI, and uh, I guess a former member, Andrew Chow, wrote most of the code. So very, very thankful for that. But uh, so what we did is we, I assume, just some 12 frame movie. So this is a, a binning thing. We could, as you mentioned, there's a binning problem, but this is the best we could do, or at least this is a good first attempt. So we had, we had some movie like this. I broke it into 12 frames. I created synthetic data with EHT, which includes the important effects like Earth rotation. So as the Earth rotates, baselines move. And then as well, um, semi-reasonable, um, a semi-reasonable noise budget. And so then what we did is we we fit using some Bayesian, some Bayesian analysis, and we let all the all the parameters of the spot change except for a couple, the uh, mass and the inclination and the position angle. And the reason for that is when we are doing this, we're imagining that we have some handle on what those are from probably fitting some average data set or just fitting some average thing over a day to get it. at least semi-understanding what the inclination, the mass we already know, and the position angle, that should also be hopefully understandable when these type flaring type events aren't happening. So, the result was is that if we fit all the parameters of the spot, which include the accretion flow parameters, we were able to pick off every, the EHT is able to pick off every parameter without any degeneracies, there's no bimodal or crazy sweeping curves, and what we focus on is if we zoom in, the spin, and then our accretion flow parameters, the spin is 
very sub percent precision in this very clean environment, which means, at least, which we think means that the EHD can extract these uh, spots to a very high precision. Now, we cheated a little bit in this test, or, well, why is this so good? First, it's this beating effect, and it's that you, the rate at which this comes and then the secondary emission flows around is why we think we're getting all this leverage. As you see this different part light up, it's, it's a time series analysis, and if, even if something is off just a little bit, eventually farther down in the data, you'll get quite big phase delays, and so you'll have quite a, quite a large uh, discrepancy. But we did cheat when we did this, in the sense that there are some known systematics for Sagittarius A star. Some are data, so there's gains in the terms of atmosphere messes up some of our signal, and then leakage, that doesn't matter too much for us since I'm just fitting uh, Stokes I. But then itself, Sagittarius A star as a system has <coughs> a couple of uh, special systematics. One is that the spot is embedded in an accretion disk. And then the other is there is interstellar, there is interstellar scattering screen, or basically dust, between us and the source. And this, this does a couple things. First, for the, uh, the RIAF, or the accretion disk that we're embedded in, we uh, we used the best fit the best fit model for the RIA from Broderick uh, 2016, which fit this semi-analytic uh, thick accretion disk model to proto EHT data and as well as light curves, and we use that as our base. And the effect of this is twofold. One is actually good. It provides because in VLBI you don't have any um, absolute phasing. The, uh, as the spot moves around, where it thinks it's looking can wiggle. So this, uh, this RIAF background really fixes the telescope. So that's one thing that's kind of nice. But the thing that we really lose on is the optical depth effects in the sense that where you can see these beautiful arcs coming off, they get quite hidden. They get quite hidden behind this RIAF here. And so we wanted to see how much this would mess us or change our results. Again, so this is models. The other thing we have to worry about is scattering. So again, there's an interstellar scattering screen, and the effect is twofold. One is that it blurs our image, and then the other is, is it adds a bunch of refractive substructure. So the light rays themselves will take slightly different paths. So its effect is to basically just shift pixels around. And we didn't actually include the refractive uh, piece in our study. Um, it was It's just actually modeling or forward modeling this refractive screen is quite difficult. And the main piece that we're very concerned about actually is this blurring, because this blurring really smears out and kills a bunch of this signal. You can see there's that secondary piece, it just becomes this tiny little blip there and it's quite low. So we won't. So going to high frequencies. High frequencies would help. If we went to 350, it would be very helpful, yeah. And of course, this scattering isn't a problem in infrared. It's the screen at that point is um, invisible. So again, we, if you look in terms of what we're looking at, these are visibility amplitudes. As we apply different systematics, so this is the original spot. This is when you apply the blurring, this out of RIAF, and then blur the RIAF. The end of the result is, is that yes, it is worse. And it is worse by a bit. So red is the spot with just this clean spot. Blue is the spot blurred, so the blurring one doesn't actually do much worse than the red, which is which makes sense in some way because this blurring is just a convolution, so it is just a multiplication in Fourier space, so it's actually very easy to invert that. What does make, what does make a change is the RIAF, so that's the green one. You can see the spin measurement gets a little bigger, but it's still quite accurate. And then the black curve is just to base yourself on what a RIAF does over an entire day. So the RIAF the RIAF fit is quite a bit broader, so even by observing a single spot over a two hour time frame, which is what we did here, you get orders of may, or you get a very large increase in um, fidelity of a measurement. So this was very, uh, very encouraging to us. And so then once you've done it once, we asked, well, these flares happen one to three times a day. That means we should see at least one, probably every observing run. So what happens if we see over the next 10 EHG observation cycles, we catch 10 flares. What does this give us? And what this gives us is you can imagine a flare happens at different radii. So this is, each one of these is the exact same flare, just put a different in a different initial radius. And if we can recover the initial radius and we have some 
parameter of our space time, so like for Kurt, mass or spin, we can check as if the recovered mass or the recovered spin is the same along, or the recovery better be the same, and in this sense, we can tomographically map space time. So if we have all these spots and they're fine, 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 and then all of a sudden, the spots that start appearing at some closer radius start petering off, we know that there is some characteristic radius where something's going on, either our our distribution, our distribution of light is a little off, or you know, the more exciting thing, maybe there's some regime where GR starts to break down very close to the black hole. So to check if we could do this, we devised a synthetic experiment. We took the exact same thing we did before. I just had a bunch of different spins. So this is spin increasing, and then this is also the initial radius of the spot is increasing. And the idea was, this is quite far in the ISCO, this is about the ISCO, and then these two are a little past the ISCO, and we wanted to see how much this initial radius changes our, dis our, our ability to constrain. You can imagine if the spot was 20 M out, the lensing becomes much weaker, and you wouldn't be able to get quite as good of a signal. And the, the upshot is, is it's actually there. The, the upshot is that it actually doesn't matter. We were able to get identical spin measurements or almost very very close measurements on radius and the these uh, accretion flow parameters independent of what radius it gets a little worse at some radius but one interesting thing is is that it actually has an inverse relationship in some of these cases where the very the spots very close to the black hole are less constrained and what this is is just optical depth effects as the thing gets super close to the black hole those wings and the the secondary emission that you see gets damped a lot. And so it's actually better if you go out to a slightly farther radius in a lot of these cases. And the end farther than the ISCO. Farther than the ISCO, yeah. Farther than the ISCO. Yes. And if you do this, and if you try to make that tomographical map I was talking about, this is what you get. These are the recovered spins and radii for each one. Each one recovers accurately. And then these are the error bars. These are the 95% uh, uh, upper and lower confidence intervals for the measurement. So you can see for this one, for the spin half, it's actually better at low spin. Some of these other ones, it's different. But th and then it gets better again at something about 1.6 times the scope. But the end of the day is, is that at least with the EHT in the 2017 configuration, we think we can recover these spots, or we can hopefully recover these spots quite accurately. And learn something about either this will provide in a direct measurement of spin for Sagittarius A star, and then also some accretion flow dynamics, how subcaplarian the accretion flow is, how much infall there is. You're talking about this as if it's a prediction, but in fact you have the data. So I don't know, do you already know the answer? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> So what's next? Um, there's the data. I'm not talk about. It. But uh, the other thing is, is I want to. This is still a very clean environment. One of the big tests is sticking a spot into an actual GRMHD simulation and seeing how much that messes things up in terms of turbulence in the disk. We want to make sure that this doesn't. You don't get massive biases in the reconstruction. The uh, other one is, is we do have these um, parameterized metric deviation models where it's, it's not an actual solution of any of any theory but you can parameterize deviations from GR and I'm interested to see if I make these some spot model like this and then I just try to fit it with GR is how, how uh, tight or how do we actually see some curvature like this or is it still just dead GR so how what's the fidelity of this measurement at least in some linear linear regime and then of course <laughs> if you want to look at different inclinations, this is something that's being done right now. Um, and then, yeah, there's a, lot, a bit of development with the spot stuff. But that's it. Any questions? So, Paul, oh, right towards the end, you said that you want to take a simulation, put a spot in it, yeah. and all that. But do the simulations already have spots? They can't. These spot. These these, uh, these these simulations can't do the magnetic reconnection events, right? Because they're ideal MHD. 
So they, they can't do these large scale flares. They could do some numerical, I guess, reconnection, but I don't think they see these large. Yeah, they do have numerical dissipation, which becomes yeah. heat. So in fact, the simulations do have hot regions and cool regions. Question is, as they exist today, the yeah. whole simulation library, I, I, have you actually looked to I, see whether I, they have a few orbiting spots once in a while? Um, we have. I've, I've looked through some of the simulations. I know uh, George uh, George Wong in um, yeah. Illinois has sent me some simulations, and there, it does look like in some of these that you do see these big wings things coming off, and I. I, uh, I've been meaning to fit something like that. I also have George is going to send me some with these spots injected in it. So, but I'm going to try both and see. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, how much would the spots contribute to the variability that we see in the infrared versus the submillimeter? And I, well, I guess they have the same uh, orbital period, whatever component you're you're looking at because it's just following the same spot. But I mean, it could be a smaller fraction of uh, one part of the special energy distribution than the other. Are these significantly driving a lot of the, the fast variability that we're seeing in the infrared, for instance? This is a great question. Um, there is lots of evidence that, I, I believe, there's lots of evidence that, or there's some evidence that the X-ray light curves and the infrared light curves follow, or at least there is there could be some delay, but they're together. There's actually not a lot of evidence for the submillimeters if they go together or not, just because it was, it's hard to get everything going together and pointed. But there's not a ton of evidence that the infrared and the submillimeters go together. But if they are these flares, they will be seen by the EHT. So I would, it, the potential is, is that some of these infrared flares aren't these hotspot things and there's something else. It could be that half the time or a quarter of the time or a tenth of the time you get this hotspot and the other chance it's just some um, pop or something flying off in accretion and disk or something. And then the simulation. That's th th that would be something else that you would have to do. But I, I think what we're looking for is specifically ones where there is some detection of orbital motion, or there is some detection, or these they're very violent flares. If you scaled this up uh, to M87 and looked at the I mean, ambiguously changing southern brightness in the yeah. It's, it looks like, you know, four or five days is not way off, right? It, it's so, not. And uh, I think, um, so specifically for M87, uh, I know Avery's other student, Britt Jeter, has looked at this, where he's put some spots into these accretion flows and trying to, and trying to see what you get. It's really interesting, um, and it could be, you know, because if you do measure an orbital motion and you really believe something, you would be able to get a much better measurement of like the mass of M87 versus just looking at the diameter where you have that. The time scale is a different thing, right? This, uh, Avi, go ahead. There is another thing to keep in mind which is interesting and perhaps has no observational consequence but could. And that's the fact that a star like the Sun would get badly disrupted uh, at roughly one astronomical unit, which is 10 Schwarzschild radio mm -hmm. radii of such a star. So that means that uh, you could potentially have stars orbiting within tens of Schwarzschild radii, yeah. and that could be a hotspot. Yeah, it, it could be. In that case, it might not. The shearing wouldn't be quite right. The uh, I guess the <laughs> orbiting one would be a little more because it's a little more focused. But yeah, that would that would, that would be another thing if it's a, if it's an actual star just sitting there that goes into the disk and gets some tidal disruption. That would be interesting. Other questions for Paul? If not, thank him and both of our speakers again.